Okay, so the truly dedicated. <laughs> Thanks for coming this morning. Um, so this is just my this is my screen as I left it yesterday. I feel uh, this is the first time we've ever done this course, and I feel like it's it's going pretty well. But it's about it's about like the first time we taught the other course, where there, we made th- you know I felt like we also made some things overly complicated <laughs> and left people going what. <laughs> uh, so, so people were very enthusiastic about the first course, but they definitely were. There was like areas that, and ways that we taught things that people that they were like, "Oh, please make that simpler." Um, but so I just wanted to wrap up because some people ran down and said, "Like, how am I going to use this tool?" Uh, and and the intent is is not that you would use this tool. Um, this you know, this is. This was mostly created for those of us who are working on improving automated peak picking scoring algorithms. But I thought, as I was learning things, I thought it would it was fairly instructive for anybody who's thinking about like, oh, should I use this algorithm or this algorithm? Or, um, you know, we have a lot of evidence that that uh, open swath, uh, skyline, and spectronaut actually do fairly similarly. Um, and then I, I wanted to get across this point that like you frequently, if you just run one of these tools, then you'll, what you will be able to see if you don't actually do a manual validation and then you know if you don't, if you don't do your own manual validation, you really have no idea what the true false discovery rate is. You'll just see the tool, you know, the, so you imagine this plot without error bars, and that's what you get out of these tools. Um, and so, you know, as, as we said, oh, you know, boy, if, if I were doing a side-by-side comparison, I really want the green one. And, but really, it's, it's just a, that's a figment of your imagination because it's just that the green, the green one is reporting a 1% false discovery rate when it actually has a 2% false discovery rate. And so if a slight calibration issue with the way the, the tool report and reports uh, its values, and, the, and so as not to point any fingers at anybody, these are both coming from Skyline, uh, ends up looking like this. And so, so you may say, oh, I really want, but really, what you'd really prefer is the more correctly calibrated one. And so if you had visibility into the actual false discovery rate, you'd want the, you'd want the yellow one. So that was, that was part of the point. The other point was to, to just that you could go discover where things had, where, th- where errors had been made by actually looking at the data. Obviously, if you're doing this for tens of thousands of things, you can't look at the data for everything. So what I would recommend is that you, that you run statistics and figure out what you think is interesting and then go look at the data for what you think is interesting, right? So, so you're going to look at 10 to 20,000 things. You're going to end up with a few hundred maybe that you think are going to be relevant to, to your study. Um, and don't just, you know, you don't just go say, yep, my statistics say that these 200 did this and so now I'm going to write a story about that. Uh, it's, it's important to go... And, and inspect the chromatograms. So, the, yeah, that was, those are more the points that, you know, cast a doubtful eye to, to, to really believing exactly what any tool reports at 1% false discovery rate because there's, there's an error bar around that 1% false discovery rate. And, you know, uh, so... so uh, we have a tendency to go like, oh, this one got you know this many, and this one got this many, and sometimes it's not it's not actually the error bars are bigger than 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 we think, and we actually are just looking at exact numbers. Okay, so um, so I wanted to go back. So that's it for that one. <laughs> We're gonna call that whole set of exercises done. Uh, I guess I'm not going to save those changes. Um, and then I now wanted to summarize the, the, what I had been talking about on the first day, this DIA query design, which is another area that I think we made things 
too complicated. <laughs> uh, and it's partly because you know we we are two different labs developing developing two two sets of tools, and so uh, yeah, okay. So we had we had this essentially this image that that I showed you on the first day of you know there's this we both agree that, you know that you do DDA acquisition, and then there's some spectrum matching on that, and then you're going to try to create a library. And then, you know, as labs, we we either, you know, are using. Somebody have a, a microphone on. Uh, yeah, I think you bumped your microphone. Uh, so, you know, the aerosol lab tends to go generate libraries in Spectrast, and then they and then they're, you know, creating transition lists. Uh, and and then adding decoys and then running stuff into open swath. Uh, I guess the simplest um, method that I would point you to for if you're using Skyline is just to go right into Skyline. Skyline has something called BiblioSpec, but you would build build your library in Skyline as we've done. Uh, you would do your transition picking in Skyline and add decoys in Skyline and then run your 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 data query in Skyline. One thing that I realized that I think would simplify what we're teaching here for next year is if we could agree actually to just kind of, uh, well, it, I, I would need to implement Skyline exporting the, the Trammel or TSV that OpenSwath needs. And then I think we could be teaching this, <laughs> where, where we get rid of all those extra things that you run. And then both, we would have a comet run for spectrum matching, or you could, in the, you know, we'd have DIA umpire, and then we could build the libraries in BiblioSpec, you know, or, and or build the library in Skyline, and and you could, we could even be doing that with a command line, right? We've been running Skyline Runner, we we could have a fully command line batch script that led to open swath but went through Skyline so that then later if you wanted to go back and query your data in Skyline that would be simpler and so I think there are workflow simplifications that will that I'm hoping that next year when we teach this will will uh will make what we're teaching a little bit a little bit more you know coherent and not so many things pointing out oh do this and then come back over here and then come over here so we, we've created a lot of flexibility so that the tools can interact, um, but I think that's led to this. This, and then you tell me, tell me if you feel this. I feel like it's it's led to this feeling of like, wow, this is really complicated. There are so many options, and and uh, and it might be simpler to if we streamline the workflow that we teach you. And I and I, I feel like. Uh, you know, I've I've helped to complicate things where where actually, if you really want to just get started, there's some fairly simple workflows that you can just get through and get started. So, but uh, so that's what I'm thinking. So I would, so I'm I think the best thing to do right now is to go back to our day one <clears throat> and and pick up. We had we, you know we left day one and then and then went to running command line. Go back to day one. Where we had a document that we had uh, we had just built a library in Skyline, and we didn't actually get through um, transition choice. So we're we're sort of right, you know, right here where we haven't actually imported, in, and we have a blank document with a library in it, and that we took our comet results and we imported them into Skyline. Do people remember that? Anybody go like what? <laughs> okay, well, so. Uh, Let's go. Let's go back uh, to the VM, and so I think that I at least have DIA course data, and then we had this DIA course blib file. Does, is there anybody who doesn't have that? So we so this 
TTOF64 Windows is the template that we've been using with the command line. The DI course blib was the thing that we created after on the first guide jam. And if you don't have it, or you put it somewhere else, uh, you can always download it, right? So, so hopefully, one of the things I suggested was that everybody just leave leave a web page up with this with this set of files. If you grab this DIA course blib, you can so you just check it here and then click this download button, save, open the folder, and here I ha I already have a copy of it, but. Uh, so in my downloads folder now, I have DIA course blib.sky, and then I can go to DIA course and drop that into data. And now I could unzip that in place and have, have the DIA course file. Is there anybody who needs help getting a DIA, uh, getting this DIA course blib file? Are we people aren't uh, people looking at their screens? So I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna assume you'd have a red post-it up at this moment. <laughs> uh, but when everybody's kind of looking forward, I'll, I'll go ahead. So the so the goal is to actually to get your DIA course blib dot sky into Skyline. It's going to look like this, a blank document. There's, so we, we, had, we hadn't done the transition choice step. We haven't actually chosen any targets. Did you? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, um, so where where did you get that? Is that that's that's you? When you started opening, so how did you get to that file? You some file that you had? My file, the zip file. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's so, okay, so anyway, so somehow you, that's fine. So click Browse. And now, you, now you're just going to need to find the, the, the blib file that goes with that, that thing. So for some reason, it got put somewhere else. So I have, I have mine located, you know, my DIA course blib is right in the same, so if you put it in the same folder... Are you able to find it? Yeah, if you, if, you want, if you want to just go to the zip file, you can get everything from the zip file, so that might be the easiest way. I mean, the other, the other way, the, it's actually even easier. If you get this zip file downloaded, this is a shared document. You can actually open those zip files, so you can see here that Skyline's offering this, this DAA course blib, this uh, zip file. So you can open it from there, and then Skyline will automatically create a subfolder called DIA Course Blib, and it's put the file in here. Ooh, that is interesting. No, no, that's there's the Blib file. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um. Okay, so does everybody have that open at this point? So let's go to View Spectral Libraries. So this is the Spectral Library built out of the Comet results. Um, 
what it, uh, so let, let's click on the dot, dot, dot button over, up here. This will show us the details. So how we got to where we are, we have how many unique peptides? 13,000. Uh, total match spectra was 14,770. And then now you can see sort of the distribution of matches and best spectra across the files. And, you know, one of the things we might be looking for here is um, just sort of making sure that, like, there's, no, there's not some file that has, you know, two best spectra or something like that, because that would sort of indicate a low-quality file. Brendan, I yeah. have a question. Why do I have different numbers? So I have 13,222 unique peptides? Yeah, so I would say that m the most like, so, like, that, that would be something that we could drill in on, but I can give you sort of an immediate likely answer, which is that we had to input a cutoff score. And you, so is your cutoff score 0 0.97352? Oh, no. Right, so, yeah. so if, you're, if your cutoff score, so that's, we didn't used to show this. This is recently added. We now, we now show all these individual statistics. So we, you know, I actually got a blib file from somebody who had reported a certain cutoff, and I was like, boy, when I use that cutoff, I don't get the same thing. And then I was like, but we don't have any record of the, what they use. So I guess actually nice that we can answer that right, right now. <laughs> you didn't use the same cutoff score as I did. Uh, so, yeah, so this gives you a little bit of details about, about that. So uh, actually one interesting point about, about the matching spectra and best spectra here, does anybody... What's different about these three files? Are these three files all run on the same sample? Do you know much about these three files? Uh, these are the MZX. What? They're not. They're not actually replicates. There's. There, so we're doing a three organism mix experiment, and and each file is run on a sample that has only the organism in question. So so one of these is. Actually, what is it? It's human yeast. No, it's E. coli yeast human. And I'm not sure we're going to have time, but I was, I, I, I was also considering, uh, and maybe we'll, I don't know. Yeah, we probably won't have time. <laughs> I would, you can just import this DDA data and, and have a look at this DDA data, and then it becomes obvious which one's yeast human and E. coli because the, if you look at the MS1 chromatograms, there's like no peaks for, you know, you can just go, oh, look, you know, there are no yeast. When I look at a yeast protein or a yeast peptide, there's no peak for these two replicates, but there is for this other one. So, um, <clears throat> okay, so now we go to here. Uh, another th important thing when building a library, I like to, you know, look at the library and, and get a sense of, you know, how good do the spectra look? You know, they, they, they look believably matched to me. Um, you, if you might, you might come in here and find that you, that you don't have very much annotation or no annotation at all, and that can be controlled by these buttons over on the side. Uh, you can choose how and then you can also right-click here and choose the precursor, at, you know, annotate the precursor, and maybe that's in some of our runs. I don't know. Uh, oh, there it is. Okay. So, um, and then another place to look is down here. It, this will show you where the, spe so again, in Skyline, every spectrum you're seeing is actually a physical spectrum that was measured. Whereas with Spectrast, if you look at a Spectrast library and, and you look at one of those consensus libraries that you built, it's going to be a consensus spectrum where things have been removed and, uh, and, and there's averaging going on. And, um, and then, uh, and then, if you look at the library when you've imported an assay library, what what do we, what, what do we what have we seen about the the you know if we import a transition list into Skyline, an assay library into Skyline, what are the library what are the spectral libraries that we get look like? Does anybody remember? Six ions, right? You get the six ions, and so. If you were to say, you know, like this, 
the fact that we have the entire spectrum gives us some flexibility to change parameters in skyline and say, ah, I'm going to allow neutral losses. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to play around with what I'm, with what my spectra are. If you've imported an assay library, you need to now go back outside skyline and, and generate a new assay library if you want to change the assay at all. So you're, you're basically, you've, you've got this fixed entity, which is the, which is the assay library. And if you decide, you know, whoops, I don't actually want to, include triply charged fragment ions, you have to go regenerate the thing. Associate proteins? Yeah, so so if you did associate proteins and you went add, it would say a background proteome is necessary. To, okay, so let's go build a background proteome. Uh, so let's close this down. Uh, and go to settings, peptide settings, digestion. So close the spectral library viewer, and we're going to go build a background proteome, which is essentially taking a FASTA file and turning it into a database that Skyline can query and do useful things from. And, you know, in, in the old version of the course, we would have taken you through all of this already and you would have built a background proteome and you would see all the nifty things you can do with a background proteome, but we've kind of zipped right by that. Uh, so let's go ahead and click Add. So Peptide Settings, Digestion, Background Proteome Add. And we're going to name this uh, uh, HYE. DIA, DIA, course. Okay, so, and we're going to create a new one. And we'll just put it in the same directory, DIA course data. Uh, and I guess actually we'll, again, name it HYE DIA course. People there. So you click create, not open. <laughs> so you should see create background proteome in this in here. And all you have to do is you, it's going to be named something dot protdb. And all you have to do is type the name HYEDIA course or whatever name you, you <laughs> feel is more appropriate. <laughs> and then say Actually, okay, well, let's, so, uh, yeah, I guess we, we want to go to to the data folder, and what we're going to build it out of is this, is this NPROTO3 mixed human yeast E. coli IRT reverse, oops, reverse, so we have this, we have this issue that our, the only FASTA file we have has reversed, reverse things in it. But those should all be at the end. So I'm hopeful that we can all open it in Notepad. So if you go to DI course data and Prado 3 mixed, there's your FASTA file. And you can just go, what? They're intermixed? Oh my gosh. Okay, well, we're just going to ignore that and we'll build a background proteome with reversed proteins in it. But not not recommended at home. <laughs> Please try to find a FASTA file that doesn't have, you know, like try to find the original FASTA file. So go ahead and click Add File, and then you can choose this FASTA. So so you're gonna you've you've created your ProtDB and you click Add File. And then the file we're looking for is this reverse FASTA file with the, in the data directory. And then once, once you have it, you can click Open, and Skyline will start building the background. Pro well, it, it, will, it will at least parse all the proteins for you. So is everybody, ha is everybody there? Okay, so then click Open, and, and Skyline will start 
running through this FASTA file, and it's big, because <laughs> it's twice as big as it should be. Uh, but yeah, it's hu human yeast and E. coli all together, plus reversed, so it's kind of, it's a biggish proteome. So this, uh, so actually, yeah, I'm now thinking, <laughs> building this pro background proteome might take a while, but luckily it'll happen in the background after this. Okay, so there we go, about 60,000 proteins, which is bigger than most of you will usually use. So, so uh, yeah, let me, while we're waiting, let me talk a little bit more about background proteomes. A background proteome is intended to be sort of the, the fat, you would build it out of the fast day that you expect to see in your sample. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you would go import a, you know, oh, I'm, I'm working on plasma. If you have some, some subset of proteins that you think will be in plasma, you, can, you would create your background proteome out of that. If you were doing a nuclear prep, which uh, one of the researchers in our lab was doing a lot of, you wouldn't necessarily include the, the entire, you're doing like yeast nuclear prep, then you might use go annotations to figure out what are the proteins that are, that are present in the nucleus, and, and that would be your background proteome. So it gives you, you can certainly build it out of the entire organism or you know, multi-organism, but it, the, the idea is that this background proteome thing uh, represents the um the the proteins that that could possibly be present in your sample so if you have like an immuno pull down then you would you would reduce your background proteome <coughs> mm. did not test this <laughs> for for general consumption yeah no this is big uh, usually, I mean, usually in a tutorial we do it with yeast only, and it goes really quick. <laughs> but uh, adding the reversed and the yeah, so what has anybody? Yeah, six full. Yeah, well, but a human is much bigger than a yeast, right? So um, there we go. Saving changes. Yeah. <laughs> what? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, it's taking quite a while. Wow, saving changes. Uh, it, well, yeah. So there, are, there are a bunch of things that you can you can then test for uniqueness. You can, I mean, there's all there. So yeah, like there, you can now set settings that would say I only want unique pep peptides added to my to my file. Um, you can, you can just use. You can choose things by typing. When you're in the spectral library, you can do protein associations because the spectral library just has a knowledge of what peptides were matched. <laughs> yeah, there's, no, there's nothing in the library that says what, the, what proteins they came from. Um, so, so, yeah, at this point. Wow, saving changes is going to take a while. Uh, <laughs> I guess let's cancel. <laughs> Hopefully the cancel works. Okay. Uh, yeah. Didn't, okay. So let's just cancel out of that entirely, and we'll forget about the background proteome for now. If we, uh, much better to have a tutorial where we have a simple background proteome we can show you. Um, but certainly at home, it's not a problem to kick off a background proteome build and go to lunch or something. Because it's it's the kind of thing that you're going to build for a whole experiment and use for a long time, and so a little bit of a time is not a big deal. Um, okay, so let's let's cancel out of here. And what? So yeah, we could we could go to um, let's go back to view spectral library. So we could certainly be adding you know choosing pro peptides out of here and adding them to our document. And you can see if I do this, you know, it starts building this library peptides list. 
Whereas if I had the background proteome, then it would be adding proteins. It would be adding the rel relevant proteins. And, um, and then I could also even do add all uh, and get everything. But I get them all in this big list. And so another way to get peptides into your document is to actually just import the FASTA file. And we'll do that in a second. So does anybody have any idea what, what these icons are about and why some are missing? So the icon basically says, okay, Skyline understands what this is and, and, and could add it to your document. And the missing icon means like Skyline's not going to let you add this to your document. So I've just added a few things. If I click here, it says it actually gives me an explanation. <laughs> this is nice. We, we improve this. It used to just kind of go like, well, your settings don't match this, and then we can't add it. Now it's a little bit more explicit. It says the precursor. MZ365.2163 is not measured by the current DIA isolation scheme, right? What's our DIA isolation scheme? How, what's the range? 400 to 1200, right? So yeah, so that's so now you so you can get that information that way. If you hover over here, we're working on putting more information here. And actually, we ha I guess this is not in this version, but we have a version where the, this pre it tells you the precursor MZ. That's been added recently. And in, in the most recent version, that precursor MZ is in red, and it says, you know, less than your, you know, it will actually give you the information that we just got out of that, that message box when you're hovering. The message box. I clicked add. I just try. Oh, okay. I just try. You know. I said, oh, you, and the, and like okay. pretty much. Bef you don't. E you now know that anything that doesn't have an icon here, you don't need to click add. But it sometimes it will give you. You know. You're like, well, why why doesn't it have an icon? We'll go ahead and click add, and it will give you extra information of like, well, this is why I can't add it to your document. And it might be, it has a modification on it that I don't understand. Like, let's see, can we find a... No, we didn't, we didn't use any modifications in this. But there might be, oh, like, well, here's the cysteine. So if I hover over this, it says C plus 57. Is that right? 57, 67, 57. Uh, so it says that, yeah, it's got the C plus 57. If you had a modification, like if, you're, if your search engine produced a modification that Skyline didn't understand, C plus 152, then then it would, it would also not have, a, uh, it would not have an icon. And when you clicked on it, it would say, modifications don't match. Please check your modification settings. So, All right, so let's go actually, uh, bit, let's close the Spectral Library Explorer. Lots of useful information in here. Another thing to check is down here where we see what file it came out of and the retention time. And you want to make sure that the, these retention times are there and seem valid. Sometimes, since we support so many search engines, sometimes the retention times might come out as they would be, they haven't been correctly translated to minutes and they'd be seconds. So you might see like 1,020 or something. Yeah. Is there apex retention times or where the... This where the spectrum was collected. Yeah, we don't know. We don't know the apex. Yeah, and that's, that's kind of... One of the issues with taking IRT values calculated by either BiblioSpec or Spectrast is they're not actually based on peak apexes, they're based on spectra. And as we've talked about, if you have a tailing, if you have tailing in your chromatography, that, that really seemed to me, when I've looked, uh, and you can look at this in Skyline, when I've looked, that really kind of messes up uh, messes up IRTs, tailing and peptides, because you'll get IDs out on the tails, which have nothing to do with the with the apex. All right, so close that, and if you added any peptides, go ahead and undo the peptide adds, and now. The best way to actually get a document, uh, or you know, the way that I, I prefer is to go to File, Import, FASTA. 
So this is the transitions choice phase. We're now trying to set up our transitions. And I'm going to actually cancel out of here again. We've already, just as a reminder, we've already been through, we've already given Skyline a lot of instructions about how to choose things. So in our peptide settings, we've, we've specified the trypsin cutting. Uh, we've got IRT prediction at this point. Um, we've said the length of the minimum and maximum length of peptides. Uh, we're using a certain library. We've got modifications, um, which are, I guess, at this point only cysteine. Uh, and then transition settings. So for transition selection, we've said 2, 3, and 4. 1, 2, B and Y ions, going from ion 3 to last ion. So we've given Skyline a lot of information about how to choose transitions, right? So now we just go and say, file, import, fast A, and point it at that, that reverse fast A file that we were trying to build the background proteome for. And then click open. And this should go more quickly <laughs> than building a background proteome. Uh, so Skyline's running through all these things, parsing them, matching them to spectral libraries, and choosing transitions. Uh, and it should be done relatively quickly. And so then, then we get this message box. Is anybody shocked by this message box? can be jarring to get message boxes. This one is just telling us that, hey, the operation discarded 58,000 proteins with no peptide matching the current filter settings. So that means we just imported 60,000 proteins and, or 60-something thousand, and, and 58,000 of them didn't have, we didn't find anything in those. And actually, we'd really love it if it, you know, we're, how many are we expecting it to tell us? Does anybody have any prior expectations about what the, like, if you were just to think, you know, what should it be saying? Should it be saying anything? Do we, would we hope that we found every, every protein in that FASTA file? Which ones would we actually hope that it doesn't find? The reverse ones. So, yeah. So, like, if we had a perfect, if we'd done a perfect experiment, we detected every protein that we're interested in, it would, it would still say 30 in here because it, we would, we're hoping that it's not going to find any reverse ones. It actually did find some reverse ones, so click OK, and we'll get to see what reverse ones it found. So now you can go uh, edit, refine, uh, sort proteins by name. So edit, refine, sort, yeah? Yes. Um, I was wondering, so the, the FASTA file is from a like, normal proteome database? Huh? It's, three, it's three normal proteome databases. Together. Together. And, then and the reverse. Rever and then the reverse added. But then how, how can we get the spectra? Like, because it's not a spectra proteome, right? Like, how can... It's maybe a very basic question, but how can we... If we because if you click now on the peptides, we see the spectra. And how, how can Skyline know... Or are this calculated theoretically? So, Skyline, we've built this library thing out of the Comet results. So, so Comet used this same FASTA file and it matched the spectra to the oh, peptides. Okay, of course. Right, yeah, right. Yeah. So, yeah, so, yeah. so that's where it's cut. So now there's this file that's dot blib, and it's, a, it's now got a database in it describing what Comet found. And so mm -hmm. that's what we've been looking at. Yeah. And, now, and now we've just said, okay, let's, let's sort of build a Skyline document from the FASTA file out of everything that, that, that Comet found. And so now let's go ahead and do refine sort proteins by name. And that has the nice property of putting all the reverse proteins at the top. It also puts the IRTs at the top, which I like. Um, so can anybody guess a problem with, with interleaving your reversed with your, with your normal? 
why did I expect to see all the reversed at the end? Well, because Jim Yang told me that's the way to do it. <laughs> um, well, and, and because I found some things that were duplicated uh, between reversed and not reversed. And yeah, Jim, Jimmy was like, oh, well, yeah, that, you know, that will happen. So sometimes you will actually find spectra that match both a reverse thing and a not reverse thing. Uh, and, or no, you, you will fi you'll find peptides that show up in a reverse thing that also show up in a real protein. And if you interleave them, then the search engine will find the first instance. So it will, it will choose reverse things over your not reverse things. Anyway, so, uh, but anyway, so, so we now have this list. If you select the, the lowest, if you, if you select the first thing with, with an actual not, with it is not reversed, then you can look down here and get a sense of your false discovery rate. So uh, 24 out of 3,000 proteins, it, how close is that to a 1% false discovery rate? Pretty good. So that's what Mayu told us we should see. Like, so my, Mayu is saying, yeah, you should, you should if, you just, if you do this exercise, we're, we're, our expectation is that Mayu has given us an accurate false discovery rate at the what level? protein level so that so this should definitely be about one percent now if we go to the precursor level 34 out of 14,000 what percent is that point oh two or something I don't know if you're oh five yeah no no oh oh five I don't know so it's 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 pretty small but in order to get the false discovery rate we want at the protein level, we need it. So now let's go ahead and say, um, let's see what happens. We're going to do some extra refinement. Uh, edit, refine, advanced. And... We're going to say... we're. I, after doing, uh, uh, Olga just walked in and walked out, but we, we did a very intensive study uh, with one of these PRGs, and one of, the, one of the things that I really came away with that was that at least doing DDA, MS1 extraction, it's a really good idea to throw out anything that, that is a single hit match. So, so anything that's a one hit protein match, if you're doing protein quantification, my takeaway from that was for for DDA, it's dangerous to take those one hits because they're just much more likely to to show up as significant even when it's just some weird thing. So so let's go. But we're going to go ahead and say two and just see how that impacts things. Actually, let, uh, let's first do, uh, we want to remove duplicate peptides and we want to say six transitions. So this is, before we do the, uh, I want us to do the this minimum two protein, two peptides per protein separately, so we can see how big an impact it has. But we really don't want any duplicate peptides, and we don't want any, uh, and we want, and we don't want any any peptides that don't have all six transitions. Right, that's the same thing that we've done in building these things using. Uh, Spectrast to TSV. So click OK. Oh, let's. Uh, oh, I guess we. Yeah, that's good. Um, so you can see a lot of a lot of things lost their pluses. Um, can I actually? I think if I go back to edit refine, let me just check. Yeah, it doesn't really say anything. Like that. Okay. Uh, so let's then go edit, refine, remove empty proteins. And how many, what, how, whoa, we, yeah, we lost almost all of our, <laughs> all of our reverse already without even doing the duplicate. Uh, 
So how many proteins do we have left? Two thousand five hundred, nine thousand, uh, nine thousand eight hundred precursors. So if you control Z to undo that, then you can see we lost very few precursors, but about five thousand proteins. Wow! So uh, five hundred proteins. Yeah, control Y. What? I'm not saying, all I'm seeing is, the, oh, 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 right, yeah. So we got to go all the way back to, so we start, oh, we, so we start, we lost thousands of precursors, uh, which I guess in theory means we have quite a lot of precursors that only have five things. Yeah, and that's, you know, that's the case here. Um, we could do things like we might, we might try, uh, Adding the ability to do neutral losses, or you know, there are other way, there are ways that we could get more of these uh, if we wanted to allow them. But yeah, we've been fairly strict at this point, and we lose a lot of precursors and a lot of and a lot of proteins at this, and because we can't, they don't have six annotated ions. Okay, so let's control Y, and then control Y to redo. So, um, and then finally, now we can go and see, okay, well, what do we have left in terms of single hit proteins? Advanced min peptides per protein, two. Click OK. Wow, we lost another. <laughs> and we lose all of our reversed. Um, so yeah, we're down to 1,728. So uh, we don't necessarily have to do it, that. Well, we can undo it if we wanted to look for more. But I would say quantitatively, if you're going to do protein quant, uh, you're on more solid ground if, you've, if you don't take single hits. But we're already on so low false discovery rate that maybe we'll, we'll go forward like this. All right, so what's the last thing we would need to do this, to this document to have it be a, you know, a complete template that we could run the command line on, that we could import data into, that we could build a model for? So, so assuming we're, we're going to say, yep, okay, we're going to stick with this set. Well, we, we could delete these reverse peptides, just select them and press delete. And then there's one more thing that we need to do before we import if we're going to be building a model, what does a model require? Well, we have the IRTs. They're actually, it's, it's useful to check here. So this is, this is where we're expecting our IRTs to be. And we would like to see little IRT clock faces here saying that, yep, Skyline is ready to build an IRT model for us. So, so we're good. If you can see that if I delete half these, then the IRT clock faces go away. So Skyline says, I don't have enough IRTs for you to, to, to actually do an IRT model. So if we didn't have all our IRTs, you wouldn't have those little clock faces. So this is, this is an indication that the IRTs look okay. What else, what else do you need? Oh, decoys, right. So, so edit refine, add decoy peptides, okay. Just use the default, which is, is going to double the size of our document. We have a document that's got 100,000 transitions in it. That's smaller than what, that's about a fifth the size that we've been doing in the command line. Not a big deal. Um, so I guess, since you're all going to be listening to a lecture soon, uh, so this is now a, a complete template document. If you, if you wanted to save it as a template before you, let's go ahead and do that. So we'll just say file, save as, uh, DIA course, blib dash template. So now we've got a saved copy, which is the template one, and we can 
just switch back by using the most recently used. We can go to file, diacourse.lib, and now we go back to our original one, and we can start importing data into it. Are there any, any questions about starting this phase of My original one is empty, like in the targets. Your original one is empty in the targets. Was that? Oh, oh, you didn't. Say, oh, <laughs> you didn't do a save. Yeah, I didn't have everybody save. Yeah, mine might not be exactly what it. No, I'm, I must have saved. So, okay, so. So we can now the template. Okay, so it, okay, so the template. So if you wanted to, you could also we could go back to the template. Template is saved. It's the it's the right thing, and we can. We can press home to get back up to the IRTs. And now we could do file save as and overwrite this other one, which we forgot to save. <laughs> so basically, we just want two files that have the same thing in them. Okay. Right? So we're just trying, at this point, we're just trying to save a copy before we do any importing, model building, any, any of that stuff. We want to save a copy. And so if when you go back, it doesn't look exactly like what you just left, then, then you should make sure that they're both the same by using save as. We built the spectral library. So on day one, we went to uh, peptide settings and uh, library, and we clicked build, and then we set, and this is where we set our cutoff, and we named it, and yeah, let's see, uh, test. Um, and then we told it, hey, you're going to have these diagnosis IRTs in it. Um, and that was it. And then we, and then we just went uh, next, add files, and we added this iProfit PepXML, and that's, that was it. Then we clicked OK. So that, you know, we went through that whole build process, and then that's what we got. If you now look at... Uh, Edit, well, let's, yeah, forget that. Okay, so, so now that's, this is this DI course library that we built. We're using it. Uh, it comes from the Comet search. We could also, uh, well, let's go, let's go out. We won't use it right now, but we, we could do basically the same process. So I've shown you this thing and <laughs> this, this complicated, overly complicated graph, but I've said, you know, this is the, that, that, what the, the wizard I just showed you to build a library from the comment results, that's this BiblioSpec step. You've also done this Spectra step. You could set that up in Skyline, right? And you could do everything we just did based on the Spectra library. And I just, I came up with too many ways of doing things to talk about it in this class because there are so many ways of doing things. But we could go to settings, peptide settings, Edit list, add, and then we could just go DIA course spectrast, and we could browse. And where is the spectrast library? Tutorial one. So we go to tutorial one. Here it is the SP text cons. So that's the consensus SP text, and we click OK, and now we have a Spectras library in Skyline. I'm going to just OK this. So I'm not adding it to my document. I'm not changing my document. I'm just making it available. And now if I go back to this view spectral libraries, I've got the Spectras version, and they're pretty, pretty similar. They're incredibly similar, actually. <laughs> So I've, I've run these both side by side, and you get almost identical results, which is a really ha you know, nice thing if you, if you either build that library or you start with the Spectras library. So BiblioSpec and Spectras actually agree quite a lot, um, I guess. So since this is a consensus spectrum, what is the expectation?
Wow, they don't really change, do they? <laughs> My expectation is that some of these things are going to disappear, right? The, the consensus one should be changing a little bit, but maybe the spectra are already so good. Whoa. That's... Oh, yeah, so... That, that, I leave that as an exercise to you. You can do side-by-side -side comparison of Spectrast and BiblioSpec and what they're coming up with and, uh, and see, see what you think. Okay? So close that. Um, yeah, so now we have our template. And we could And my time is just about up. So the next thing you could do m manually here... You could either, you have a template, so you could either set up the command line the way we did for the other files, or you could go, fi you could go uh, file import results. Let's say we're going to import many, which is actually going to only be two at a time because of the processor architecture on these VMs. Uh, and we want to show the chromatogram during import. And so then we click OK. Uh, and you want to get to the DIA course data, DIA data, where we have, if you ran your overnight thing, you should have 10 folders of, of results in there. But you should also have these six MZML, MZXML files, which you've already, you've done this import for, for the reduced document that, that was in tutorial two. But this is how you would set it up for the full document and do pretty much the same thing that you've done in Open Swath inside Skyline. And then just click Open. And, oh, and then go ahead and click Remove. And that should start your import. Quest any final questions? My time is up. Yeah, um, I have a question. Yeah. Friend, or maybe at least uh, two. Uh, I usually build up the libraries from S MSF files, so this is actually huh? Protein Discoverer. Huh? Uh, use it via mascot because it's nicely set up in a daemon in environment. Huh? It always says, I cannot, although I have the percolator incorporated in this, hmm. I, uh, there is no Q value with it. Hmm. So uh, it, can, it cannot really do any type of filtering or something like this. Is I there any, know, any way to fix it or so? Uh, well, or you, to have, do something, you have something two options, basically. With mm -hmm. So uh, I recognize that we get a fair number of support questions about that, and maybe I should be working with, with Thermo more on fixing that. Uh, but at that point, you could, use, you could just say zero. So if you, if you say your cutoff is zero, that means just take everything. I don't know if that's appropriate, because if that means that you have a huge number of false discoveries, that mm -hmm. could be a really bad thing to do. Yeah. Um, so, so you have to think about your false discovery rate control and the only way that Skyline can do false discovery rate control on a Proteum Discoverer search is to have the Q values. So, so you either got to work with Thermo to go like, and, and, and Matrix Science to go, uh, or, and, and anybody, you know, like, why am I not getting Q values? Because mm. uh, I, because it seems like I should be, um, or, or you can just say, you know, we were just talking about this with, with MaxQuant, MaxQuant, it is frequently, they've already done false discovery rate filtering, filtering and, and it's frequently applicable that when you, and you load an MSMS text from MaxQuant, it's, you just say zero, I'm taking everything because I've already done filtering. So you, have to, you just have to pay attention to what does that MSF file contain? If it contains a lot of garbage, then you're going to have to find some score that you can do a cutoff with. Uh, and another question would be, is it, is it possible to incorporate somehow external data into Skyline? So, for instance, if I would like to go back to have, let's say I run all my statistics and I have a number of proteins upregulated, downregulated. So is it, is it possible to re-import these kind of things and flag them so that I can manually check a couple of those in Skyline to see how this really goes in, in, on the raw data level? Uh, yeah, there's de definitely using the, the document grid, you could annotate a whole bunch of things. Um, we haven't got, you should go read the, the, the reports and, and live, uh, live reports 
tutorial which explains more about the document grid. We haven't been, done enough of that. Okay. Uh, you, could also, you could also just decide you want to move to a next document and go file, refine, accept proteins or accept peptides. And that would reduce your document to only the things you're interested in. But if you want to get annotations in, then you're going to have to use the document grid and do some filtering so that you can, that you can paste in the annotations. Yeah. Okay. Good. Time is up. They've cut, they've cut me off. Anyway, that, that ends my, my part of this course. Thanks very much for everybody who's been showing up early and, and, and all your attention uh, during the main course when you're here. Um, yeah, it's been a lot of fun.